we take you now to the first Unitarian Church in Santa Monica, July 29, 1993. Jonathan Ott's presentation, Pharmacotheon, one of the great talks. KPFK Los Angeles. Now I want to introduce Jonathan Ott, who is one of the most knowledgeable and exciting researchers in the field, the entire field of psychedelic entheogenic drugs. Jonathan has worked very closely over the years with Gordon Wasson, who you must know was the first white man to reveal the secrets of the mushroom to Western consciousness. He's frequently called the discoverer of the psilocybin mushroom, but that's really a rather ethnocentric position. He didn't discover it at all. Jonathan has also worked very closely with Albert Hoffman for many years. He translated Albert's spiritual autobiography, scientific and spiritual autobiography. And he's also worked closely with Richard Schultes, who's discovered for the Western mind practically every psychedelic plant that Gordon and Albert missed. Jonathan's here because he has just finished writing and will soon be out. We have just a couple of copies of his magnum opus, Pharmacotheon, which I've just uh, been able to flip through a little bit, and I've read practically everything in the field of psychedelic drugs and history, and this one is uh, the most complete and exciting book to come out in a long time. So please, thanks all for coming, and join me with welcoming Jonathan Ott. Thank you. Normally, I, I don't like to read lectures, but I'm going to do that tonight, and I want to beg your indulgence, and I'll explain a little bit why. Um, as Bob mentioned, I just uh, am now publishing this book, Pharmacotheon. Unfortunately, we don't have copies to sell, but it's, uh, it is in print, finally. Uh, and what I'm going to read to you tonight is, a, is sort of a condensation of the proemium or introduction to this book. And uh, as I was writing the book, I, actually I could say I've been working on it full-time for about two years as a full-time uh, endeavor, but working on gathering the information for about 20 years. And when I started writing it, I decided, well, I better keep politics out of this, because if I don't, it will be impossible to get it published. And uh, But then I found it was coming out at the seams, and there were all these footnotes uh, being appended to dry scientific discussions dealing with the political aspect, and there's really no way to divorce politics from the science in, in this field. It has become politicized because the the field itself is, Ill, is illegal. It's, it's this pall of disreputability has been cast over it by the legal misclassification of these substances. So I decided, well, I will just take the bull by the horns and I'll go directly for the jugular and deal with the political aspect of it right up front. And uh, so that's what I've done. And I had to publish it myself. So uh, <laughs> anyway. Um, <laughs> And ordinarily, I would rather speak extempore about this or about anything else, but I tend to, even if I'm given the subject of one plant, it usually takes me about three hours to get through the basics. And so, uh, and this is a bigger subject. And so uh, I decided the best thing to do would be to condense it, and then I can go hit the high points and really get to the meat of it in about an hour. And so that's what I've done. And uh, I will read it, but there will be plenty of time for discussion, uh, and I, I hope it will stimulate some lively discussion. And uh, the title I've given this uh, excerpt is um, Crimes Against Nature, the Civil War on Drugs. To paraphrase America's rustic president, Abraham Lincoln, we are now engaged in a great civil war, testing whether the modern nation state or its citizens will be the ultimate arbiter and judge of individual well-being and health, whether the citizen will be responsible for what pleasure drugs she or he chooses to ingest or to eschew, or whether an ostensibly benevolent paternalistic state, supposedly guided by science and reason, will make that decision in loco parentis. Those paranoid individuals with no faith in the inherent wisdom and dignity of human beings today hold the upper hand, 
and ill-conceived laws have been crafted to proscribe certain drugs with the unanticipated and unintended consequence of illegalizing innumerable plants and animals which we now know to contain those drugs. It is, of course, absurd for humankind to presume to illegalize other organisms with which we share this planet, and this could be seen as a laughable example of human folly run wild were it not for the mounting toll of victims this tragic abuse of law and authority increasingly claims. Spinoza presciently foresaw the consequences of misguided attempts to, quote, control the desires and passions of men, unquote. And it is evident that the millions of contemporary users of proscribed drugs are laughing at the laws presuming to forbid them, and that they are far from deficient in the ingenuity needed to outwit those laws. It has ever been so with laws regulating the legitimate appetites of human beings, and there is no question such laws represent an abuse of governmental power. The great libertarian Edmund Atwill Wasson commented in 1914 in a critique of the prohibition of alcohol in the United States that it was, quote, one thing to furnish the law and another to furnish the force needed to ensure obedience, unquote. Law is the instrument of popular will in democratic countries, and when a law is sufficiently unpopular, as was the law prohibiting alcohol manufacturing and sale for ludibund purposes in the United States, the people in theory will rise to overturn it. Would that it were so with unjust laws or unenforceable laws. When a government proves itself all too willing to attempt to furnish the force needed to ensure obedience to unenforceable and arguably unjust laws, then the very freedoms on which democratic rule is ostensibly founded are jeopardized. This is the case with the civil war on drugs and the unprecedented intrusions into personal liberty which it inexorably occasions. It is a case where the cure is far worse than the disease, in which the proposed therapy is toxic and will prove fatal if administered in sufficiently high dosage. While the use of the drugs this shock therapy addresses continues unabated or indeed increases, freedom and dignity are on the ropes and in danger of going down for the count. I will adumbrate four lines of argument against the contemporary prohibition of drugs. Although disguised as public health laws, strictures against drugs are principally limitations on the pursuit of happiness and on the practice of religion in a broad sense, or in a sense broader still, are attempts to enshrine in law a certain perverse brand of what once was called natural philosophy. I call it science, and the overzealous modern laws against drugs are manifestly anti-scientific and indeed represent crimes against nature. A scientific perspective. Drug prohibition statutes are typically justified as public health laws, and conventional wisdom holds that in enacting and enforcing such measures, governments are exercising their paternalistic function of protecting the citizenry from dangers to public health, much as they would in framing and enforcing laws regarding sewage disposal, vaccinations, or pollution of air and water. Prohibition is thus seen as benign, indeed beneficent, and this viewpoint has become so firmly rooted in public consciousness as to make the concept accepted universally as a legitimate exercise, nay, as a solemn responsibility of capitalist and socialist governments alike. Nevertheless, viewed dispassionately and scientifically, this public health justification for prohibition won't hold water, and it can be argued rather than by placing certain drugs outside of the established quality control regimen for pharmaceuticals, governments are defaulting on their responsibility to protect public welfare. While some prospective drug users are dissuaded by laws, many, perhaps the majority, are not. During the prohibition of alcohol in the U.S. from 1920 to 1933, some alcohol users took the pledge and obeyed the law, whereas many, probably at least half, continued to use alcohol in spite of the law. Although it is impossible to establish firm numbers for present use of illicit drugs and the efficacy of the laws prohibiting them, there is no question that many millions of users, at least 20 to 40 million in the U.S., or about 10 to 20 percent of the adult population, are undeterred by the laws. During alcohol prohibition in the U.S., many inveterate users were poisoned by methanol and other solvents, poisonings which would not have occurred had legal controls of alcohol purity been in place 
poisonings which ceased to occur once Ludovin's use of alcohol and its sale for that purpose again became legal. Similarly, now there are some 3,500 premature deaths per year in the United States due to illicit drug use, many of them so-called overdose deaths from injected drugs, mainly opiates. Although these dr deaths are called heroin overdose, the great majority are rather due to adulterants and contaminants in illicit drugs, typical samples of which contain only a few percent of heroin or one or another artificial succedaneum, and illicit products may also contain dust, mites and other minuscule arthropods, spores, virus particles, and bacteria. On the other hand, medical injection, including self-administration, of sterile pharmaceutical opiates of known potency is a common, safe procedure, and deaths as a result of such use are virtually unknown. Injection of black market drugs has become a major vector of transmission of AIDS and hepatitis. Around 25% of all U.S. and European AIDS cases, including the majority of cases in heterosexuals, children, and infants, are a result of illicit intravenous drug administration. The barbarous practice of denying access to sterile syringes without a medical prescription prevails in the United States, whereas in most of the world's countries, sterile syringes are made available at low prices over the counter. This cruel and misguided measure is directly responsible for at least 25% of the new cases of AIDS in the U.S. and Europe. Far from protecting public health, prohibition is drastically expanding the AIDS epidemic and contributing to the deaths of thousands of individuals in the U.S. alone from drug overdose, individuals deprived of the protection of the Food and Drug Administration and its counterparts in other countries. This is especially important when we reflect that not all black market drugs are inebriants, not all drug users, hedonists, and drill seekers. Owing to the restrictive nature of the U.S. pharmaceutical industry, there are black markets in curative drugs which have not been approved for sale by the FDA. Examples are the controversial cancer drug amygdalin or laetril, dimethyl sulfoxide, a treatment for bruises and sprains. Users must employ industrial grade as no pharmaceutical grade is available and the AIDS drugs azithromycin, AZT, and dextran sulfate. There are even black market drugs which fit neither in the category of inebriants nor chemotherapeutic agents. Biotechnology products are coming to be used illicitly by athletes. There exists a black market in human growth hormone and erythropoietin for athletes. The black market in athletic steroids has been estimated at $100 million annually and is growing. These steroids are being sold by mail and in health food stores. Other damage to public health is occasioned by drug prohibition. Some illicit drugs have valuable therapeutic properties and thus potential to alleviate human suffering. They are not being systematically researched and developed as pharmaceutical products owing to the pall of disreputability cast over them by their legal misclassification. LSD was originally developed by Sandoz of Switzerland as a pharmaceutical agent under the trade name Delicid. While the novel medicine showed considerable promise in psychotherapy, one of the most exciting pharmaceutical prospects for the drug was as an analgesic and psychotherapeutic adjunct to agonious therapy, treatment of patients with painful terminal cancer or other fatal diseases. LSD and other entheogenic drugs proved to be valuable, long-lasting analgesic agents in some patients with severely painful terminal conditions, drugs which did not be numb and cloud consciousness in the manner that potent opiate analgesics do. The drugs also proved their worth in brief psychotherapy, aiding dying patients to cope with their situation. The propensity of entheogenic drugs like LSD to work against drug addiction led advocacy of their use to be termed an anti-drug position. Thanks to this demonstrated medicinal value, the Swiss government recently reclassified LSD as an experimental medicine, making it again available to physicians. Entheogens have also shown promise in treatment of alcoholism. Despite this plethora of therapeutic benefits of entheogenic drugs, their pharmaceutical development was cut short by their legal proscription and their illogical classification in Schedule I, drugs with, quote, no currently accepted medical use, unquote, all but eliminated further research along these lines. Heroin, called deadly poison in the U.S., continues to be regarded as valuable medicine in other countries such as Great Britain. 
Heroin or diamorphine is considered to be more effective and safer than morphine in treating the pain of myocardial infarction. Since both heroin and LSD have legal medicinal uses in other scientifically advanced countries, their U.S. legal designation as drugs with no currently accepted medical use is patently false and prejudicial. The illicit drug best known for its medicinal use is marijuana. This drug has shown many medicinal properties, but is best known as an anti-nausea agent for patients receiving cancer or AIDS chemotherapy and as an appetite stimulant. Smoked marijuana and orally ingested tetrahydrocannabinol, THC or marinol, one of the active principles, have proven to be valuable adjuncts to cancer and AIDS chemotherapy. Nevertheless, the U.S. government, to avoid giving mixed signals, recently stopped distribution of marijuana to new cancer and AIDS patients, although for the moment marinol will still be available. There is some evidence, however, that marijuana may be more effective for some patients, and it would be less expensive were cultivation for this purpose permitted. The U.S. government does, in any case, give mixed signals with regard to marijuana and THC. On one hand, the marijuana plant and its active principle are listed in Schedule I as having, quote, no currently accepted medical use, unquote. Then the same government shows the error of this misclassification by itself distributing marijuana and THC for medical use. These and other examples show that a decidedly negative result of prohibition of drugs has been curtailment of promising lines of clinical research and withholding potentially valuable medicaments from the public. Laws are thus working to the detriment of public health in contrast to their ostensible purpose. Meanwhile, the proscribed drugs are available to all comers, and users are deprived of the guarantees their taxes are paying FDA authorities and their foreign counterparts to provide. Yes, junkies and long-haired potheads pay taxes too, and enjoy the same rights to protection as nicotine fiends and short-haired gin freaks. Just as serious as keeping potentially valuable medicaments from the pharmacopoeia is the curtailment of basic scientific research consequent to prohibition, bureaucratic difficulties with research involving illegal drugs, and stigmatization of the field in the eyes of other scientists and personnel and governmental agencies cause basic research with controlled drugs virtually to disappear following their proscription. Scientists have been forced, for political reasons, to discard tools offering an approach to the classic brain-mind problem of philosophy, the biochemistry of consciousness itself. Nevertheless, such research will continue in countries with fewer regulations or a more enlightened drug policy. The U.S. Controlled Substances Analogues Act of 1986 has been perceived as illegalizing synthesis with the intention of studying their effects in human beings of any of the illicit substances or their automatically illegal congeners. It is illegal in the U.S. to synthesize and test completely novel compounds, the government in essence presuming to declare anything illegal unless specifically authorized. Talk about socialistic central planning and governmental control of industry. Pursuing this sort of draconian legal overregulation will ultimately doom the U.S. pharmaceutical industry to technological and economic inferiority as the next generation of mind drugs is developed elsewhere. Practical and legal considerations. The fundamental problem with drug control is that most human beings in all eras and cultures about which we know have used drugs to modify their mood or state of mind. In the U.S., there are nearly 200 million people over the age of 12 of which 178 million are caffeine users, 89%, 106 million are alcohol users, 53%, 57 million are nicotine users, 28%, along with approximately 12 million marijuana users, 6%, some 3 million cocaine users, 1.5%, 2 million heroin users, 1%, with about a million users, 0.5% each, of the entheogens and non-ethanol solvents according to the government's conservative data from a household survey. Not only are numbers of illicit drug users greatly inferior to numbers of users of legal psychoactive drugs, but the scope of health problems associated with illicit versus licit drug use shows a similar disparity. Compared to the estimated 3,000 to 4,000 deaths per year as a consequence of all illicit drug use combined, 
which I might add includes people that were shot by the police and during arrests. Approximately 320,000 Americans die prematurely each year as a consequence of tobacco use, and they are accompanied to the graveyard by an additional 200,000 premature cadavers each year, resulting from use of alcohol. Although there are approximately three times as many nicotine users in the United States as users of all illicit drugs combined, there are nearly 100 times as many deaths as a result. And although there are about five times as many alcohol users as illicit drug users, alcohol is responsible for some 50 times as many deaths. One might conclude that tobacco is some 30 times more dangerous than entheogens, marijuana, cocaine, and heroin, and that alcohol is about 10 times more dangerous. Or one might claim that in time we will discover that additional premature deaths are in fact due to illicit drug use. Nevertheless, the disparity is striking, and it cannot be argued that illicit drugs are justifiably illegal because they are dangerous, as long as substances evidently much more dangerous are legal. Many people persist in ignoring the fact that nicotine is an addictive drug, but former U.S. Surgeon General C.E. Cook stated plainly, quote, the pharmacological and behavioral processes that determine tobacco addiction are similar to those that determine addiction to drugs such as heroin and cocaine. We should also give priority to the one addiction, tobacco addiction, that is killing more than 300,000 Americans each year. In the former Soviet Union in 1990, tobacco shortages sparked widespread riots, forcing emergency importation of American cigarettes. Long-suffering consumers would endure stoically chronic shortages of foods, clothing, and energy, but not tobacco. This, in the country in which the real czar once ordered the execution of tobacco smokers. Former National Institute on Drug Abuse, NIDA, Director W. Pollan stated that tobacco addiction was, quote, no different from heroin or cocaine, unquote. The severity of nicotine addiction has been underscored by the recent introduction of products to ameliorate the nicotine withdrawal syndrome, such as nicoderm patches, transdermal nicotine bandages, and nicorette gum, which became famous when former drug czar W.J. Bennett, who had given up a two-pack-per-day cigarette habit to set a good example, later admitted that he had relapsed and was still hooked on nicotine gum. Just say no and do otherwise. Not only is psychoactive drug use nearly universal among American adults, but virtually every culture that has been studied has been found to make use of one or another inebriant. Moreover, there is increasing evidence for the use of medicinal and inebriating plants by non-human animals, leading to the new specialty of zoopharmacognosy. Clearly, use of inebriants is a normal, ordinary activity, virtually universal among members of our species, and any attempts to pro prohibit one inebriant in favor of another, involving questions of taste, tradition, and prejudice, rather than scientific criteria, is destined for trouble. Laws will not deter many millions of people from using the drugs of their choice, but they can distort and pervert the legal system and wreak all sorts of havoc in the attempt. An avowed purpose of drug prohibition is to increase street prices of illicit drugs. The costs imposed on traffickers by the necessity of escaping detection and by the loss of occasional shipments or the arrests of personnel constitute a business tax which is passed on to the consumer. The expenditures on drug enforcement can be seen as a subsidy of illicit drug dealers. By driving up drug prices, laws enrich criminals and lead to theft and other crime to enable users to pay. Arbitrarily classifying millions of users as criminals and forcing users into contact with criminal elements sometimes associated with drug trafficking, drug laws then provoke more crime. Drugs, which would otherwise be cheap, become expensive in consequence of official policy, and theft and related crimes increase proportionately. Public health is again degraded as citizens are placed in greater danger of crime. Scientific developments, meanwhile, have compromised severely the forensic chemical basis for evidence in drug-related prosecutions. The discovery that the illicit entheogen DMT appears to be a mammalian neurotransmitter and that the drug normally occurs in human cerebrospinal fluid raises important legal questions. Diazepam or Valium has been found in rat brain and in trace amounts in wheat grains, and diazepam-like compounds have been found in bovine urine. 
Controlled opiates, morphine and codeine, have been found to be normal components of human cerebrospinal fluid, and morphine has been found to be a trace constituent of cow and human milk and to occur naturally in mammalian brain tissue. Trace amounts of morphine have been detected in various plants, such as hay and lettuce. Trace amounts of morphine in poppy seeds on baked goods can show up in the urine of the diner. With detection of morphine in urine considered prima facie evidence of heroin use in methadone clinic patients and in job applicants, and with drug laws flatly proclaiming that unauthorized possession or sale of, quote, any material, compound, mixture, or preparation which contains any quantity of, unquote, DMT, Valium, morphine, and many other drugs, where does this leave the concept of drug control and forensic chemical evidence? If morphine occurs in hay and lettuce, in poppy seed rolls, in every one of our bodies, even in mother's milk, on what scientific basis can an unauthorized cultivator of opium poppies be punished without also punishing lettuce and hay growers or proprietors and employees of supermarket chains and corner groceries for illicit trafficking in morphine present in every quart of wholesome milk? As citizens subjected to the absurd consequences of drug laws, we demand to know. On what basis? The absurdities and incongruities into which we fall in the looking glass world of the drug warriors by no means end there. A recent article proclaimed that the U.S. National Institute on Drug Abuse, quote, aims to fight drugs with drugs, unquote. That, quote, the agency is planning a massive search for medications to treat cocaine and other addictions, unquote looking for, quote, magic bullets for addiction, unquote. The only magic bullets for addiction the authorities have found so far are the 38 caliber variety injected by police special revolvers. Let's treat whiskey addicts with gin while we're at it, or heroin addicts with methadone. Surely they can't be serious. Do they say this with tongue in cheek, or do they have something else in cheek? perhaps a goodly quid of leaves from the stupid bush which the CIA chemical warriors were searching for in the Caribbean in the 50s and seemed to have found at home in Langley. Note that heroin was originally marketed as a cure for morphinism, and one of the magic bullets against addiction, bromocryptine or parladel, is already suspected to be an addicting drug. Of course, NIDA has no intention of treating whiskey addicts with gin, more like treating whiskey addicts with methanol, forcing people off one drug which they happen to like, and substituting another drug which will do everything for them but provide the pleasure they originally sought in drugs. This is treatment or assault. Meanwhile, as thousands are arrested for possession of cocaine, it has been found that a, quote, material compound mixture or preparation which contains any quantity, unquote, of this controlled drug is the bulk of American paper money. In an, in an analysis of 135 Federal Reserve notes of varying denominations and from different parts of the country, all but four, 97 percent, contain detectable quantities of cocaine. This means that virtually all Americans are in unauthorized possession of a Schedule II drug all the time, or do you have a prescription for those banknotes, with the richest perhaps being in possession with intent to sell based on the gross weight of a big roll of cocaine-containing greenbacks or ought we now call them white backs. Since the citizen carrying his Federal Reserve notes is legally just a bearer of a note which is the property of the Federal Reserve Bank, does this mean that it is the proverbial higher-ups who are to be arrested? Do I hear calls for an indictment against the chairman of the Federal Reserve Bank and the secretary of the Treasury for cocaine trafficking? Or since the buck ostensibly stops on the desk in the Oval Office, let's go right to the top of this sordid drug ring to the President of the United States. Never mind the fact that the U.S. currency is printed on paper containing hemp, i.e. marijuana fiber, or that Betsy Ross's first American flag was sewn of hemp and cloth, or that the originals of the U.S. Constitution and Declaration of Independence are scrivened on hemp fiber parchment. Chemical technology has progressed to such a point that we are all in danger of being the enemy in the war on drugs or prospective casualties. A military pilot, an officer in the U.S. Air Force, was court-martialed for illicit drug use when amphetamine residues were detected in his urine. Thanks to a little detective work, it was proved that an over-the-counter anorexic diet pill 
that he had been taking legally, a product containing phenylpropanolamine as active agent, was contaminated in the manufacturing with trace amounts of amphetamine, as were other lots of similar products. The disgraced pilot was given back his commission and reinstated to active duty, but not restored to his prior flight crew status. A company called Psyche Medics is fighting the urinalysis lobby for a piece of the $200 million per year U.S. drug testing market, promoting a technology based on detection of infinitesimal residues of drugs or drug metabolites in hair samples. There is evidence that merely touching your hair after handling some of the Federal Reserve Chairman's cocaine-blighted bills could make you subject to a positive reading in a hair analysis drug test or taking a stroll through the park and inadvertently passing through some marijuana smoke exhaled by some brazen lawbreaker. It has been shown that such passive exposure to cannabis smoke can lead to false positive readings for marijuana use in blood and urine tests, too. Drug tests involve the problem of false positives if detection thresholds are set low enough to detect all users. In urine, cannot tell whether morphine in the urine came from a shot of heroin or a few poppy seed rolls. Do you think the troops fighting the war on drugs are on your side? Can you be sure you won't one day be considered to be the enemy? Perhaps the skinheads are onto something. Let's face it, we're all on drugs, all of the time. I'm not talking about the industrial quantities of alcohol, caffeine, nicotine, marijuana, cocaine, heroin, etc., consumed regularly by humankind, but about the DMT and morphine our bodies make for us and which we consume all the time, or our very own sleeping pill, the endogenous ligand of the Valium receptor, which may be Valium itself, or the anxiety peptide which blocks that receptor, or our endorphins and encephalins, which kill our pain, or substance P, our own pain-causing molecule, or anandamide, the endogenous ligand of the THC marijuana receptor. The life of the mind, of consciousness, is a constant, ever-changing pharmacological symphony, or to put it less romantically, a never-ending drug binge. The urge to ingest opiates or DMT or Valium is completely natural and as organic as can be. We are only supplementing or complementing endogenous drugs that make our brains work, and exogenous drugs are effective because they are identical to or chemically similar to our own endogenous drugs. Commonalities in drug abuse, irrespective of gross pharmacological differences between different classes of drugs, exist because on one level, all psychoactive drugs are the same. They are all fitting into our own brains, own receptors for our own homemade endogenous drugs. Let us now examine the standards prevailing in a modern American drug violation prosecution. Entrapment of the defendant is the rule, and eyewitness testimony purchased from avowed criminals, whether outright with cash or with pardons or reduced sentences, is de rigueur. The luckless defendant may have been subjected to an illegal wiretap or search and seizure without warrant or probable cause, but since the police were acting in good faith, the police are always acting in good faith, aren't they? The evidence is admitted. More shocking and fraudulent is the established practice of regarding one gram of 10% heroin to be one gram of heroin in considering sentencing or the charge. Possession is distinguished from intent to sell, which carries much stiffer penalties by the quantity of the drug seized as evidence. This is especially absurd when LSD is seized. Doses may contain only 25 or 50 micrograms of the drug on a piece of paper or gelatin weighing tens or hundreds of milligrams. Imagine a farmer with a couple of tons of hay on the truck, hay which contains morphine in trace quantities. By this standard, she or he could be arrested for possession of a few tons of morphine. How about a raid on the pasteurization plant to bust the nefarious pushers of tons and tons of morphine, milk containing the drug, that is? My ludibrious tone masks genuine concern. As a citizen subject to entrapment and wiretapping, to all sorts of chicanery, prestidigitation, and fraud in the name of police work, I demand to know, we must know, 
On what basis can ill-starred individuals in possession of grams or kilograms of illicit drugs be prosecuted while ignoring traffickers in tons of Valium, morphine, codeine, DMT, or any, other, any number of other controlled drugs? On what basis? Entrapment, wiretaps, searches without warrant or probable cause, arbitrary enforcement due to the very ubiquity of controlled substances in our own bodies, on our money, and the milk we drink, these disreputable, slipshod, and unethical enforcement techniques threaten our freedoms and human rights. However bizarre or illegal a police tactic may be, once accepted in a court of law, then cited in another judgment, it becomes a precedent. And what once was a heavy-handed excess by rogue elements of police operating outside of the law slowly becomes standard practice acceptable in any courtroom. The use of emergency measures to deal with the epidemic of drug abuse and tolerated by judges who have swallowed anti-drug propaganda is changing the relationship of citizen to state to the detriment of individual liberty. Civil rights guaranteed by the Bill of Rights, the U.S. Constitution, the right to privacy, freedom from unauthorized search and seizure, the presumption of innocence, are steadily eroded and wear away. And to us, we're um, having some technical difficulties. I'm going to switch machines and see if that repairs it. We're listening to Jonathan Ott in a presentation, actually reading uh, from the beginning of his book, Pharmacotheon. And we will return to Jonathan Ott as soon as I move machines. Ott Pharmacotheon. Civil rights guaranteed by the Bill of Rights of the U.S. Constitution, the right to privacy, freedom from unauthorized search and seizure, the presumption of innocence, are steadily eroded and wear away, as surely as Thomas Jefferson's face disappears from an aging nickel coin, and police state tactics that began as wartime expedients justified by the deadly menace of drugs are suddenly being applied to all areas of law enforcement. Already we are seeing the same Gestapo-inspired police state tactics in the enforcement of other laws. Bizarre and illegal raids and seizures have been directed against so-called computer hackers, the police assiduously taking advantage of the legal dispensations given to the drug warriors. Can anyone be deluded into supposing that the U.S. government will draw the line at computer hacking as it flexes its new police muscle? Is it likely U.S. law enforcement officials will draw the line anywhere? The chief of Amsterdam's narcotics police commented that the war on drugs reminded him of the Gestapo, German police who, quote, thought they could change society's behavior. The police are a very dangerous element in society if they are not limited. We know what war means. We fight war against our enemies, not with our own citizens, unquote. The Netherlands has drug laws similar to American laws, but the government administers them in a fashion characterized as harm reduction or flexible enforcement. Narcotics chief Zal commented that illegal drug users are, quote, patients, and we can't help them by putting them in jail, unquote. In the wartime United States, then Los Angeles Police Chief Daryl Gates testified to the Senate Judiciary Committee that illicit drug users, quote, ought to be taken out and shot for treason, unquote. In the war on drugs, only the users are shooting the drugs. The police are shooting at us. People are the enemy. People become casualties. It is a dangerous game, and the black marketers are setting rules of engagement, an inevitable and predictable result of concentrating control efforts on the supply rather than the demand. The U.S. war on drugs is a supply-side endeavor. 71% of the funds in the fiscal year 1991 National Drug Control Strategy were destined for reduction of supply, 29% for interdiction and international control, and 42% for law enforcement, only 29% for demand reduction. And I might add that, to his discredit, Clinton continued those same priorities in his first budget for drug control, so-called. 
Since more than 75% of the 750,000 yearly arrests for drug violations in the U.S. are for simple possession, mainly of marijuana, it can be said that the U.S. law enforcement effort is directed at punishing users rather than reducing the supply. Interdiction and international control and toward interception of the drug at U.S. borders, the wholesale price of cocaine dropped 80% during the 1980s, while the purity of the drug as retailed increased fivefold, according to the U.S. Drug Enforcement Administration's figures. Since the DEA reported in 1987 that the foreign export price of cocaine represented only 4% of the retail price, there is no reason to expect a reversal in this utter failure to reduce supply. The drug is so cheap to produce and so lucrative that traffickers easily counteract any increased activity or expenditures by the authorities. Again, the laws constitute a subsidy to the traffickers, a value-added tax, and the money put into crop substitution in Peru constitutes a direct subsidy to increased planting of coca. Since interest rates are so high, farmers plant a small parcel in one of the accepted substitute crops as a cover, then use the bulk of the funds to plant more coca, the only plant sufficiently remunerative to enable them to repay the loans except for opium poppies, that is. Heroin production is even more lucrative and even less influenced by enforcement activities. According to the DEA, the foreign export price of heroin is only a fraction of 1% of its U.S. retail price. As the international control efforts against heroin have been directed chiefly at the Golden Triangle area of Southeast Asia and Eastern Europe, traditional opium poppy growing regions, the traffickers have simply introduced opium and heroin production in areas not traditionally known for this. Opium poppy cultivation has become so widespread in Mexico that that country has become a leading heroin supplier to the U.S. Opium poppies have become the natural and preferred substitute crop for coca in South America, and heroin production is starting in Bolivia, Colombia, Peru, and Guatemala. The drug war has thus led the black market to its own crop substitution scheme, with the result that any reduction in the supply of cocaine will be more than compensated for by a substantial increase in the supply of heroin. This is progress. This is protecting public health. The U.S. authorities have been relatively more successful in reducing the smuggling of marijuana into the country, yet there is a plentiful supply of marijuana on the U.S. market. Not only is the drug cheap to produce, foreign export price 1% of U.S. retail price according to DEA figures, but the unintended, though entirely predictable results of the U.S. campaign against the drug have been the conversion of the U.S. into one of the world's leading producers of marijuana and the transformation of many former marijuana smugglers into cocaine and or heroin smugglers. As costs of smuggling increase, smugglers will turn to loads with a higher value per unit of weight. Thus, exaggerated attention focused by the authorities on the smuggling of marijuana has led to vastly increased domestic production, obviating the necessity of sneaking the drug past beagle-eyed customs officials. The value of the U.S. marijuana crop in 1987 was estimated at $33.1 billion dollars. The market is still supplied, but in a manner much less visible to the authorities, immeasurably more decentralized, and much less susceptible to control efforts. While this development may help the country's international balance of trade, it hasn't made much of a dent in the supply, and has made future attempts to influence the supply infinitely more difficult. Furthermore, the necessity of indoor intensive cultivation to escape surveillance has led to the development of super-potent strains of cannabis. The price has gone up, but producers continue to supply the market with a product superior to that formerly smuggled, are much less likely to be arrested, and are making much more money. Does anyone still doubt that producers and traffickers of illicit drugs are the chief beneficiaries of the laws? Another predictable response to supply-side enforcement efforts has been the introduction to the black market of a series of completely artificial heroin analogs. 
The first of these designer drugs to appear on the U.S. market were derivatives of Demerol, such as MPPP, which is about 25 times the potency of the parent compound and about three times the potency of morphine. The most famous of the designer narcotics, however, are the compounds known as China White, derivatives of the medicinal narcotic fentanyl, a compound some 100 times the potency of morphine. The best known of these black market derivatives is alpha-methylfentanyl, roughly 3,000 times the potency of morphine. According to the DEA, starting materials and equipment to make a kilogram of this drug cost about $2,000, with the product being worth as much as a billion dollars. Of course, they tend to inflate those figures, but... This drug was an invention of black market chemists, never described in the chemical literature. It took the DEA a while even to figure out what it was. They first published an incorrect structure. Supply-side enforcement directed at opium poppy heroin production has stimulated domestic production of inexpensive succedania, thousands of times the potency of morphine. In a similar manner, exaggerated attention focused on cocaine production and smuggling is fueling the growth of the U.S. amphetamine industry. Annual domestic production of amphetamines is estimated to be worth $3 billion dollars. Again, the U.S. trade deficit has been helped, but large-scale enterprises like heroin and cocaine production are replaced by practically invisible substitutes. Instead of international networks of growers, harvesters, chemists, and smugglers, now all that is required are solitary chemists inside consuming countries. Production costs go down, profits skyrocket, chances of arrest are reduced. Illicit drug manufacturers and retailers couldn't be happier. It is simply too easy to outwit the drug laws. Before the authorities realize what is going on, talented surreptitious chemists have invented new, more profitable, and legal succedania for controlled drugs. When one of the designer heroin labs was busted, the chemist told police he was experimenting with snow cone flavorings. When the results came back from the forensics laboratory, the police found they had no case against the person. When alpha-methylfentanyl was identified and the drug was scheduled, the ingenious chemists made parafluorofentanyl still legal. Finally, the Controlled Substances Analogs Act established the novel principle that any chemical or pharmacological analog of any illicit drug could be deemed to be illegal. This is a textbook case of an unconstitutionally vague statute, the purest essence of arbitrary and selective law enforcement crystallized in a form more potent than any fentanyl derivative. Never mind that this absurd law makes anything illegal which some police chief or district attorney doesn't like and is illegalizing scientific research into mind drugs and making the whole field of chemistry suspect. The important thing is it won't work. Sure, it will enable charges to be brought against manufacturers of new analogs on the rare occasions when such are arrested. But the genie is out of the bottle. The laws have made illicit drug synthesis so profitable, and it is such a simple task that no law will stop it. Having touched on the subject of constitutional vagueness, it is important to stress that scientific research continues to reveal new plant and animal species containing illegal drugs. Since controlled substances such as DMT, morphine, and codeine appear to be general mammalian neurotransmitters, dog, cat, horse, or other mammal owners are technically an unauthorized possession of illicit drugs all the time. There are at least 89 species of mushrooms now known to contain illegal psilocybin, and another 57 species can safely be assumed to contain this compound. There are at least 250 plant species known to contain illicit drugs. Some, such as the forage grass, Phalaris erundinacea, are common articles of commerce, which can be purchased cheaply by the truckload. Some, like the psilocybin mushrooms, grow adventitiously all over the world. Since one would have to be expert in plant taxonomy and phytochemistry and would have assiduously to study the latest research reports in order simply to know which plants are illegal, plants which might grow unbidden on one's property at any time, it can be said that the laws interpreted as proscribing these plants are unconstitutionally vague. It is not immediately obvious to the ordinary citizen nor indeed to anyone, just what is illegalized by these laws. With the advent of the Controlled Substances Analogs Act of 1986, any and all plant and animal species can be said to be illegal at the whim of the government. 
Short of being an expert in several scientific fields and devoting considerable time, money, and effort keeping abreast of the latest phytochemical and botanical research, some of which is published in German, Spanish, French, Italian, Czechoslovakian, Norwegian, or other languages, there is no way for any citizen to be certain she or he is not an illegal possession of a prescribed drug. This is all a result of misguided supply-side enforcement. As long as demand exists for illicit drugs, and as long as the laws guarantee, nay, subsidize the profitability of meeting this demand, people will line up to enter this business. As even informed opponents of drug legalization acknowledge, only by targeting the demand side can we make strides toward reducing the consumption of illicit drugs. Empty propaganda accompanied by a war against users. Recall that 75% of arrests in the U.S. are for simple possession. Users who are treated as vermin, as vectors of transmission of a plague, only alienates them still further from authority. Only by treating people with respect and offering them unbiased information and viable alternatives can governmental authorities hope to dissuade users from this or that drug. There is evidence that information campaigns can influence drug use. Suasion, not coercion, is the answer, and the voice doing the persuading must be morally impeccable. As Shakespeare's Hamlet lamented, aye, there's the rub. Moral Aspects of War It is commonly stated that illegalizing drugs is the moral thing for a government to do, since drug use is thought by some to be immoral, even to degrade the moral fortitude of citizens. But governments taking this moral stance mostly sanction and support use of drugs like alcohol and nicotine, as do the vast majority of those citizens morally opposed to illicit drug use, the great bulk of whom are themselves drug users. I might add this holds true for moral condemnation in some Muslim countries of alcohol and corresponding prejudice in favor of hashish and opium. This is a universal, not an American tendency, although the drugs accepted vary from one society to the next as, of course, do the drugs scorned. The most obvious of the immoralities of drug prohibition involve the above-mentioned perversion of law enforcement the drug laws inevitably foster. Since the nebulous alleged victims of drug law violations do not file charges with the police, to enforce the drug laws, the police have to become criminals themselves. Thus, tax monies are used to buy and sell drugs. The police disguise their true employment and act as though they were everyday illicit drug merchants, hoping to get close to Mr. Big to try to sell him some of their dope or buy from him some of his. Then, surprise, out come the guns and badges. Not only do police immorally become liars and drug dealers, but such operations invite corruption, and there are innumerable instances of police freelancing on the side. Annually in the U.S., some 100 police officials are indicted in federal courts on corruption charges related to drugs. Should Mr. Big come up short of cash for the big buy, some other undercover agents will step in and provide financing. There have even been cases in which reluctant individuals were provided with government money to buy government drugs and then arrested. This is law enforcement or manufacturing ersatz crimes. Besides shootouts between rival gangs of police fighting over turf and mistaking each other for the enemy, there was recently a case of computer hacking by the police. During confirmation hearings for drug czar W.J. Bennett, Delaware Senator Jay Biden, chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee, described a case in which personnel of an unnamed federal agency involved in the war on drugs, quote, surreptitiously lifted another agency's budget by altering a computerized file, unquote. No wonder Bennett went back to his nicotine habit. Another immorality of the war on drugs involves questions of emphasis. Grossly exaggerated attention has been directed toward apprehending and convicting drug offenders, many of whom become subject to compulsory sentencing. Although the staggering number of annual drug arrests in the U.S. represents only about 2% of the true number of offenders, trying and punishing those convicted is clogging our criminal justice system. In Washington, D.C., 52% of the felony indictments were for drug law violations in 1986. In New York in 1987, 40%. Police resources, which ought to be destined for arresting violent criminals, are being squandered on drug users and the occasional merchant. Worse, already convicted violent criminals are being released from jail early 
to make room for the compulsory sentenced drug offenders. When the second drug czar, R. Martinez, was governor of Florida between 1986 and 1990, Florida had in place strict mandatory sentencing laws mandating three or minimum sentences for using, buying, or selling illicit drugs near schools, public parks, or college campuses. During his tenure, average sentences served by Florida murder convicts decreased 40 percent, and the average robbery sentence served declined 42 percent. The overall average sentence for all Florida convicts declined 38 percent to the point where the average convict was serving 32.5 percent of his sentence before release, less than a third. Some luckless student caught sucking on a joint after school serves three years, if not more, while the violent criminal gets three years and walks in one. A society that coddles murderers and armed robbers in order to get tough on potheads is not walking the moral high ground. Is it moral to launch aerial herbicide spraying programs in South America against coca cultivation, indiscriminately destroying crops and forests, polluting watersheds, and in general causing untold ecological havoc? It is significant that the Eli Lilly Company, manufacturer of an herbicide which the U.S. government wished to spray in Peru, refused to sell the product for this purpose. The biocide is so persistent in the environment that it is not approved in the U.S. for spraying on cropland, and the area in which the coca spraying was to be carried out is interspersed with plots of food crops. A State Department official told Congress the department was exploring ways to compel Lilly to produce the herbicide for the government. So this is how free trade works. In the upper Huayaga Valley of Peru, 1.5 million liters of paraquat have already been sprayed, while massive spraying of paraquat, 2,4-D, and glyphosate in Colombia have already provoked health problems in the indigenous population. Is it moral to tell poor Peruvian and Bolivian peasants that they must cease to grow their traditional and most lucrative crop, coca, which is legal in their countries, in favor of some substitute acceptable to bureaucrats in the United States, which will yield them a much lower return, perhaps only a third of their already meager income? It is immoral and a fundamental violation of their human rights. How does a rich, well-shod, well-fed city slicker explain this drastic pay cut to a poor, malnourished, possibly barefoot Indian that she or he must cease to grow her or his traditional crop, the legal stimulant coca, and substitute instead coffee, another legal stimulant acceptable to the gringos? And as much as coca is known to be one of the most nutritious vegetables available in the Andes and an integral and nourishing part of native diets, and coffee, apart from a decent amount of the B vitamin niacin, is virtually worthless as a food, forcing this substitution in the moral struggle against drugs will increase malnutrition and hardship for these poor Indians. There is also a glut of coffee on world markets, and coffee prices continue to fall with no relief in sight for beleaguered growers. Of course, we must explain to them that cocaine is destroying the health of our children a continent away. Although we do need some of their coca to flavor our Coca-Cola, our accepted caffeinated stimulant that we give to children as a matter of course, and to produce pharmaceutical cocaine. But how would we feel if a force of morally outraged South Koreans descended on Virginia and nearby states and began to spray herbicides on the tobacco and adjacent food crops and to insist that our farmers instead plant ginseng? <laughs> what has that to do with the subject? It happens that our government recently coerced the Korean government into accepting American tobacco in exchange for computers, stereos, and ginseng to help balance the payments. And there are Koreans who are justifiably outraged morally and claim that our tobacco and Marlboro Man propaganda for use of this pernicious addictive drug is destroying the health of young Koreans. What if a renegade band of Mexican police kidnapped an American citizen, dragooning him to Mexico to be tried and punished under Mexican laws? American police have done precisely that in Mexico, and more than once, despite protests from the Mexican president and ambassador. How can it be possible that the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that American police operating out of the country are not bound by constitutional limitations on their power? That came as a shock to the Mexican government, which knew all too well that the DEA Myrmidons were not operating under Mexican law. Is it moral? 
that American tax monies be used to finance in other countries, police tactics like indiscriminate roadblocks and searches which are illegal in the U.S. The only moral principle followed here is that might makes right. There is another flagrant immorality in drug prohibition. Try though the government may to convince America's poor that crime doesn't pay and drugs equal slavery, a bizarre and insulting message to African Americans whose ancestors were brought to the Americas in chains of literal slavery with the sanction of the government making the statement. Children in America's ghettos see who is upwardly mobile in dead-end neighborhoods, who has the cars, friends, and fancy clothes, the drug dealers. The drug dealer on the corner is doing obviously much better than the guy flipping burgers for minimum wage or sweeping up at the supermarket. The lure of the free market in drugs brings out the entrepreneurial instinct in people who haven't fair and open access to the legitimate business world. By making drugs a lucrative business open to all, prohibition sets bad examples for youth, and there's the rub. Young ghetto children can see where the opportunity is, and in the ghetto, it's definitely not at the corner burger joint. It is in drugs. I need not mention that laws contributing to the spread of AIDS and hepatitis, laws which keep valuable medicines from sick people whose suffering would be alleviated by them, laws which hamper medical research, laws which lead to deaths by poisoning from contaminated and adulterated drugs the government is responsible for overseeing, that laws like these are immoral. If we study the history of these laws in the U.S. where they were first enacted, we find them grounded in racial discrimination. This is immoral, and drug legislation used as a cover for official discrimination is morally tainted thereby. This litany of immoralities of drug prohibition, which by no means exhausts the subject, is less significant than the glaring and fatal flaw in the supposititious moral campaign of the U.S. government against drugs. It is a case of the filthy pot calling the kettle black. For the U.S. government, like many other governments in the world, is and has ever been earnestly engaged in the drug business. According to U.S. government figures, recent annual direct tax revenues to federal, state, and municipal governments in the U.S. from alcohol sales amounted to $10.3 billion. In other words, all levels of government in the U.S. are engaged in the drug trade, making about $50 per year in alcohol income from every adult American, teetotalers included. Governments in the U.S. also profit from taxes on tobacco, feeding nicotine habits, and the U.S. federal government subsidizes cultivation of this most deadly of all drugs. Recall that tobacco use causes 320,000 premature deaths per year in the U.S. alone. Thus, all levels of government in the U.S. are profitably engaged in the drug business, even monopolizing sale of alcohol in many states and fixing prices. The moral campaign against illicit drugs is thus exposed for the hypocritical exercise it is. For moral reasons, we won't let you use this or that drug, but we'll be happy to profit from your use of alcohol and nicotine. Hell, we'll even guarantee profits of tobacco growers and help them push their dope on unwilling foreign customers. This is no moral campaign. It is basest hypocrisy. Furthermore, the United States government is guilty of massively abusing LSD and other drugs. In the 1950s, the Cold War raged, and one American fruit of the resulting institutional paranoia was MKUltra, an insidious domestic research and spying operation run by the U.S. Central Intelligence Agency, and similar non-conventional chemical warfare studies conducted at the U.S. Army's Edgewood Arsenal. In research into interrogation drugs and illegal chemical warfare agents, LSD and other drugs were given to at least 1,500 American soldiers and countless civilians. Some of the troops were coerced into volunteering for the tests, and some of the civilians were given drugs without their consent or knowledge. One such dosing of a civilian employee of the CIA, Frank Olson, led to depression and suicide. The government kept secret the circumstances of the death, but when a lawsuit forced public disclosure of the MKUltra files, then-President Gerald Ford was forced publicly to apologize to Olson's family. Canadian citizens subjected to psychological torture, including repeated doses of LSD, as part of this research, later sued the U.S. government and were paid compensation. One civilian subject of the Edgewood Arsenal tests 
was killed by an overdose of MDA, an army doctor commenting, quote, we didn't know if it was dog piss or what it was we were giving him, unquote. The CIA employed prostitutes and surreptitiously filmed U.S. citizens unwittingly drugged by the prostitutes as they disported in bed. Helpless mental patients in a New York institution were almost killed by murderous injections of bufotenine and DMT combined with electroshock and insulin coma. Over 800 drugs, including LSD and bufotenine, were tested on prisoners in the federal government's Lexington, Kentucky Addiction Research Center Hospital. In this publicly funded institution, officially a penitentiary, which existed to cure drug addiction, prisoners were given injections of heroin and morphine as payment for cooperation in the experiments. When Sandoz of Switzerland, owner of the patents on LSD, refused to cooperate with the U.S. government's desire to stockpile the drug for military purposes, the government ordered Eli Lilly of Indiana to make the drug in violation of international patent accords. Yes. Eli Lilly and the CIA became the first illicit manufacturers of LSD more than a decade before the drug was illegalized. Dosing people with experimental drugs without their consent or knowledge, especially helpless mental patients and prisoners, is highly immoral, not to mention the immorality of employing prostitutes with taxpayers' money to dope unwilling Johns while perverse CIA agents made stag films. There is no doubt this research was instrumental in spreading extra scientific use of LSD all over the U.S. and in many other countries, while publications by phony CIA front research foundations, such as the Josiah Macy Jr. Foundation, were fostering scientific, popular, and clinical interest in the drug. This immoral research and consequent promotion of lootable use of LSD was conducted by the same government which later presumed to illegalize entheogenic drugs on the grounds of morals and to protect public health. Not only is the U.S. government engaged in trafficking legal inebriating drugs and guilty of abusing LSD and other drugs in secret experiments, but there is abundant evidence that at times this same government itself has been engaged in illicit drug trafficking to raise money for covert military campaigns. Under the pretext of aiding the Hmong of Laos, our democratic allies in Vietnam, secret CIA front companies such as Air America were smuggling opium to Saigon from the Golden Triangle area of Southeast Asia. Since the major cash crop of the Hmong was opium poppies for illicit heroin production, the government secretly began opium smuggling to help our allies get their product to refineries in Saigon. Such smuggling was repeated in the shameful Iran-Contra affair during the administration of Ronald Reagan. In violation of a congressional ban on military assistance to the Contras, a CIA-organized and funded band of anti-Sandinista Contra Revolucionarios Reagan's covert warriors organized secret shipments of weapons and ammunition to the Contras. Some pilots engaged in the illegal gun running testified before a U.S. Senate committee that once munitions were unloaded from the aircraft in Central America, cocaine or marijuana was loaded for the return trip. Pilot M. Tolliver described transporting 15 tons of weapons from Homestead Air Force Base in Florida to Aguacate, Honduras in a DC-6, which he flew back to Homestead, loaded with 25,360 pounds of marijuana. This cocaine and marijuana no doubt contributed greatly to the off-the-books financing of the sleazy operation. One of the most famous LSD chemists of the 60s, R.H. Stark, was later exposed as a U.S. CIA contract agent in a sensational Italian trial. Was this man freelancing, or was the CIA purposefully distributing LSD among radicals and hippies in a harebrained sort of unconventional chemical warfare attack? After all, the CIA had pioneered underground LSD synthesis and had fomented use of the drug in research sponsored by phony CIA front organizations. I submit that a government like that of the United States of America, which is running a profitable multi-billion dollar legal drug pushing operation, a government which has secretly poisoned countless civilians, including helpless mental patients and prisoners, with LSD and other drugs, and surreptitiously filmed doped taxpayers cavorting in bed with government paid prostitutes, a government which has driven one of its own employees to suicide by secretly doping his cocktail with LSD, 
a government which has not hesitated to smuggle narcotics and cocaine to raise dirty money for illegal military campaigns in violation of congressional bans, that such a government has no moral basis whatever for prohibiting any drug. The actions of this government, not its words, show callow disregard for public safety and a willingness to stoop to anything to further domestic or international political aims. The economic side of the coin. In President Clinton's first budget, the annual cost of the American war on drugs rose to more than $13 billion. As U.S. military forces get more deeply involved in the war, costs are bound to skyrocket. Michigan Senator C. Levin estimated military costs at $2 million per drug seizure, U.S. Navy costs at $360,000 per arrest. Now the country with the world's highest per capita prison population, the U.S. Sentencing Commission estimates that in consequence largely of drug laws, federal prison populations will double or triple from the 50,000 current inmates to 100 to 150,000 in the next decade, half of whom will be incarcerated for drug violations. Drug convictions have become the leading cause of incarceration in the state of New York and elsewhere. This massive misappropriation of taxpayers' money is enriching criminals, contributing to the spread of AIDS and hepatitis, hampering biomedical research, degrading the morals of police personnel who succumb to corruption, contributing to lack of respect for authority, and abjectly failing in deterring the 20 to 40 million Americans who persist in using illicit drugs. If, instead of ceding control of the drug market to criminals who become rich and powerful, our government were, were to legalize these drugs, the $13 billion loss could be converted to a like or far greater sum in new taxes, which could be used for education and treatment. Psilocybin showed promise in preliminary experiments of cutting the recidivism rate of paroled convicts. Instead of going broke building prisons for 20 to 40 million American drug war criminals, ought we not investigate one illicit drug which may keep people out of the prisons we already have? Far more important than money saved by ending prohibition, however, is the fact that the government could finally begin to exercise control over the market instead of defaulting on its responsibilities and relinquishing control of the market to the criminal element. Let there be no mistake about it. Illegalizing drugs in no way controls the market. The government illegalizing drugs is turning its back on control and leaving it to the black marketeers to control the market. The illicit merchants, not the government, determine purity and adulteration. They, not the government, decide what products to sell and set prices. Instead of wasting $13 billion a year on a war on drugs, which exacerbates the problem and subsidizes criminals, it is high time the U.S. government stopped abdicating its responsibility and began to attempt to control the use of drugs in American society. From the past to the future. We have seen that prohibition of drugs is economically ruinous, largely ineffective and anti-scientific. Far from guaranteeing protection for public health, prohibition leads to the spread of AIDS and hepatitis while inhibiting biomedical research and depriving the public of vital new medicines. We have seen how anti-drug laws are grounded in racism and foster crime while subsidizing drug merchants and manufacturers and favoring decentralized domestic production of the most potent drugs. There is no doubt that enforcing drug prohibition distorts jurisprudence owing to the lack of victims to file complaints with police and because of the arbitrary nature of enforcement given the ubiquity of controlled substances in our bodies, in our food, even on our money. The laws immorally corrupt our police, lead to coddling of violent criminals, set bad examples for our youth, and deprive us of our freedoms as they lead to a dictatorial police state. In the international arena, the laws lead to bad relations with other countries, military and paramilitary invasions and covert military operations, loss of human life and rights, and massive ecological destruction by herbicides and uncontrolled contamination from clandestine laboratories. In short, drug prohibition is impractical, ineffective, uneconomic, anti-scientific, unhealthy, immoral, unecological, undiplomatic, and dictatorial. But, <clears throat> for the sake of freedom and dignity, for the sake of democracy, in the interests of shoring up the battered U.S. economy, 
It is time to call a truce in the war on drugs, an unconditional ceasefire. Happily, there is a straightforward way out of the horrible mess the drug prohibition laws have got us into. Legalize the drugs. Some people consider the notion of drug legalization to be bizarre and radical, a drastic step. But inebriating drugs have been mostly legal throughout the millennia of human existence. The drastic step was taken in the second decade of this century in the United States, when for the first time large-scale comprehensive legal control of inebriants was implemented. Some claim that legalization represents a daring and risky experiment, but they are wrong. Prohibition is the daring and risky experiment, and although it would be prudent to gather more comprehensive data on the results of this experiment in social engineering, it is safe to say as we approach the end of the eighth decade of federal control of inebriating drugs that the experiment has been a dismal and costly failure. Use of inebriants is as natural as any aspect of social behavior. It is the attempt to control this normal drive that is bizarre and unnatural. As I stated, it is a crime against nature, against human and animal nature. Drug laws are the monstrous result of institutionalizing paranoia. They are the work of paranoid control junkies who have no faith in others or in human nature. They would control the lives of others according to their own more responsible, more scientific, more moral scheme. But the reformer's zeal for more control has led to less. Our societies have lost control over inebriating drug use by placing this outside of the law. Every salvo in the quixotic war on drugs is a backfire, a shot in society's own foot. We are hacking and hewing at the branches of the problem, never seeing the roots, which are the very laws against drugs. The problems we attribute to the scourge of drugs are the results of the drug laws, not of drugs. The overdose deaths, shootouts between rival drug gangs, drug-related spread of AIDS and hepatitis. In the paranoid fantasies of reformist zealots, drug laws are all that stand between the current level of inebriant use and a vastly increased epidemic of heroin, cocaine, marijuana, and LSD abuse. But a recent nationwide survey in the U.S., found only 2% of respondents were, quote, very likely or somewhat likely to try cocaine were it legalized, while 4% declared themselves very likely to try legalized marijuana, and an additional 6% somewhat likely to try that drug. At the turn of the century, with a free market in all inebriating drugs, it is estimated that only 4% of the U.S. population was addicted to the heroin, morphine, cocaine, and other drugs openly sold in patent medicines. No, the great majority of today's would-be heroin, cocaine, LSD, and marijuana users are already using these drugs, for the laws not only fail to deter them, but even attract a sizable number of people who use illegal drugs out of rebellion. And we already have an epidemic of psychoactive drug use in this country, as evidenced by the 178 million caffeine users, 106 million alcohol users, 57 million tobacco users, 12 million marijuana users, and at least 3 or 4 million regular users of psychoactive prescription drugs such as Valium. Entrapment of the defendant is the rule, and eyewitness testimony purchased from avowed criminals majority of users exercise control and responsibility, and a generally small minority of users come to be controlled by the drugs. This happens with alcohol as well as with heroin, with tobacco as well as marijuana. Making all drugs available legally will certainly change the numbers of people using individual drugs, but the total number of users will stay about the same, because already more than 90% of our adult population is using drugs. If amphetamines become legal, some will surely begin to use them, as they have always been popular when legally available. In 1962, the U.S. FDA estimated annual domestic production at 9,000 million doses, 9 billion doses. But we can be sure that these prospective amphetamine users are already using caffeine, and if they use amphetamines, they will use less caffeine or none. Since caffeine generally appears to have more severe side effects than amphetamines, this could represent a net gain in public health. Similarly, heroin and other potent opiates are generally incompatible with alcohol. It is safe to assume that were more people using legal heroin, fewer would be using alcohol. Since alcohol is far more toxic than heroin, this too could represent a net benefit for public health. The unfortunate fact is, 
that our society has blindly accepted as orthodox inebriants two of the most toxic pleasure drugs known to science. Together, these drugs kill more than a half million Americans each year. Alcohol is not simply an addictive drug. It is carcinogenic and causes irreversible brain and liver damage. It is a teratogen. It causes birth defects if taken at the wrong time by pregnant women. In a ranking of general carcinogenic hazards, it was estimated that the lifetime cancer-causing liability of drinking one 250-milliliter glass of wine daily, or 30 milliliters of alcohol, was more than 5,000 times greater than the combined lifetime cancer risk represented by the U.S. average daily dietary consumption of PCBs, polychlorinated biphenyls, DDE, the common metabolite of pesticide DDT, and EDB, or ethylene dibromide, an antifungal fumigant. The U.S. average dietary consumption of these chemical residues equals 2.8 micrograms per day. The connection between alcohol and crime and accidental injury is striking. 54% of all jail inmates convicted of violent crimes in 1983 had used alcohol just prior to commission. In 10% of all work-related injuries reported in 1986, alcohol was a contributing factor. In 40% of the 46,000 traffic deaths in 1983 and 40% of suicide attempts that year, alcohol was likewise a contributing factor. Alcohol use is estimated to cost the U.S. economy $100 billion each year. Tobacco is more than a highly addictive drug. It is a potent carcinogen, and its widespread use has transformed lung cancer from a medical curiosity to a common disease. We have already embraced a couple of the worst drugs known with open arms, but we are so used to them that it's no big deal. We forget even that they are drugs. We talk about alcoholism and drug abuse as though alcoholism were somehow different from drug abuse. By the same token, were heroin legal and widely used, although it might cause some health problems in a few, we would think it was no big deal. And indeed, heroin is not much more than an addicting drug. It is not carcinogenic like tobacco and alcohol. It does not cause brain or liver damage as do those legal drugs. It is not teratogenic. About the only health problem associated with its habitual use, excluding infections associated with dirty syringes, infections which don't occur with normal medicinal use of heroin in Britain, is constipation. There is no question that the U.S. would have far lower medical costs if we had 106 million users of legal, sterile heroin and 2 million alcohol users instead of 106 million alcohol users and 2 million users of virus-ridden, adulterated, ersatz heroin. We already have about the worst situation vis-a-vis -vis drugs, with our national drugs being carcinogenic, hepatotoxic, neurotoxic, and teratogenic, and with the government having surrendered control of the use of most other drugs to the criminal element. Truly, there's nowhere to go but up. There have already been some limited experiments in relaxing the drug laws, and in general, use levels stay about the same or go down. In the 11 American states that briefly decriminalized marijuana in the 1970s, the number of users stayed about the same. In the Netherlands, legal tolerance of cannabis use and its legal control has led to a significant decline in consumption. In 1976, 10% of 17- to 18-year-old Dutch citizens used illegal cannabis whereas by 1985 this percentage had almost halved to 6%, according to official Dutch figures. The Dutch government is succeeding, as it intended, in making cannabis use boring. No rebellion there. The prohibition experiment has failed miserably, and it is high time we went back to the natural order of things and let society learn how to regulate and control drug use socially and medically, not legally and by force. The introduction of distilled alcohol to European society led to epidemics of uncontrolled excessive use. But in time, without government intervention, Western societies began to make their peace with alcohol, a process which continues evolving, developing rituals to help control alcohol addiction, such as social approval of alcohol use only after the day's work and general condemnation of alcoholic dependent behavior. During the U.S. alcohol prohibition period, the government of Great Britain was able to achieve equivalent or greater reductions in alcohol consumption than were seen in the U.S. with careful regulation of a legal market, increased taxation, restriction of hours of sale, control of sale to minors, etc. 
Modern societies will not sanction nor approve irresponsible use of legal heroin, cocaine, or marijuana, just as they do not sanction uncontrolled use of alcohol. The legal availability of tobacco and alcoholic beverages does not mean societies encourage their use, and there is evidence that anti-alcohol and anti-tobacco advertising campaigns conducted by the U.S. and other governments are effective in restricting use. Only by bringing all ludibrium drug use into the open can we hope to develop social restraints favoring responsible use of the presently illicit drugs. We must treat citizens as responsible adults, not promulgate the absurd and fallacious notion that certain drugs destroy will and self-control, thereby giving immature and irresponsible individuals a ready-made excuse for illegal or immoral behavior, the idea that one's heroin habit made one rob friends and family or steal a woman's pocketbook. We must give people choices based on a free market and unbiased information about the benefits and dangers of all drugs, not unrealistically expect to scare people away from certain drugs with silly propaganda. Treat citizens like irresponsible children, and many will behave accordingly. It is time our governments exercised appropriate control over the presently illicit drugs by guaranteeing purity and dosage. It is up to society and to us as individuals to do the rest. Okay. This is KPFK Los Angeles, 90.7 FM. You're listening to Something's Happening, featuring Dynamite Radio for Night People, Monday through Thursday, midnight to 6. We are listening to Jonathan Ott, O-T-T, the name of the talk, as well as the name of his latest book at the time, 1993, Pharmacotheon. 